Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here to answer a question that several of you have been asking, and I'm just delighted to talk about this topic. It's awfully interesting. The question was, what did I mean when I said that so many modern conductors, younger conductors, don't understand sonata form? They don't know how to conduct movements in sonata form. And in order to answer this question, we have to talk about a few basic principles first. Um, the first basic principle is that this is a gross generalization. We should know about that. This is based on listening to lots and lots of modern conductors play lots and lots of music in sonata form. Now, music in sonata form generally refers to classical period music, Haydn, Mozart, Beethoven, as well as the big romantic composers, Tchaikovsky, Brahms, Dvorak, Bruckner, all of those people. And even today, you know, composers are still writing in sonata form. So it, it, it's not like uh, something that's gone away or disappeared. I mean, Shostakovich was a big sonata form guy, for example. So when we talk about not understanding sonata form, uh, let's let's also be clear about something else. I, I, I am not so arrogant as to think, well, maybe I am arrogant, but I'm not stupid. I, these people are superbly well-trained, these conductors. Many of them are instrumentalists and conductors. They're far more musical in their education than I am. They understand harmonic analysis and the essence of what sonata form is better than I ever will. And I freely concede that, but that is not the issue. The issue is, what do they do? Not what they know, but what do they do with what they know? How do they realize that, that knowledge in terms of uh, the interpretive decisions that they make during performance? And that's where the problem arises. So what is sonata form? What do I mean by they don't understand sonata form? Well, sonata form is, is dramatic movement through time. That's what it is. It's, it's dramatic movement through time motivated by the resolution of harmonic conflict. Now, I know that sounds, you know, that sounds kind of technical, and it is kind of technical, but the, the basis of any sonata form movement, and really any movement, first movement form in most symphonies, and 99% of the symphonies you'll ever hear, is that from the moment it starts, the music is going somewhere, and it's not going to stop until it resolves. Resolves means returns to its home key, its home base, to the place where it started, the area in which it started. And it music goes on a journey. And, you know, how that journey operates is the job of the conductor. He's supposed to be our guide to that journey. And the journey is supposed to sound inevitable and exciting and, in, and organic. And there's supposed to be an overall sense of structure and, and inevitability to where the music is going. And it's the conductor's job to ferret that out and show us where the music's going and how it's getting there. That's and the composer's job, too, obviously. <laughs> the composer's done their job already, and it's up to the performers to let us hear what they did. That's the basis of sonata form. But there are a couple tricks that make sonata form a little more complicated to realize than that very simple initial explanation you know, you start, you go somewhere, and you finish back where you began. Th th that's not quite so simple, how you realize it. Because sonata form movements are essentially binary. What that means is they have two parts. The first part is the exposition. It gives you the material that's going to be the subject, our characters who are going to go on the journey. Um, and then the second part is the development and recapitulation, that is, what happens to those characters, and then their eventual finding their way back home. I mean, that's how it works, in two big parts. And both of those parts can be repeated, which in itself is a bit of an issue. Because if you start somewhere, and you're going off on your journey, and you get to the first stop, you don't usually want to go back to the beginning. You forgot your your keys, your luggage or something, and start all over again. And similarly, if you've gone through a series of adventures and arrived back home, you're not going to want to say, oh, dear, 
I mean, I, 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 I dropped something at the airport. Now I have to go back and go through those adventures all over again and get home all over again. That's a conflict that's at, at inherent in the nature of the form as it's come down to us. Now, composers sometimes um, address that in many ways by eliminating repeats, by changing the way they handle repeats and composing the repeats into the music so they sound more inevitable sometimes. Sometimes they just sound bad. And these are the reasons why, how we can say that conductors do or don't understand a sonata form movement just by looking at that one issue. But there are several issues that make modern conducting, the approach to music and sonata form, uh, more difficult for modern conductors than it used to be. And the question of repeats is a wonderful place to start because it's, it's, it's a big one. It's a really, really big one. The issue is this. It used to be, the time was, that repeats were simply ignored. <laughs> Nobody took them. Um, and today, everybody takes them, observes them as a matter of course, thoughtlessly, just as they were thoughtlessly ignored in previous times. But the fact that they were thoughtlessly ignored when you heard big romantic symphonies, like, for example, Dvorak's New World Symphony, which you wouldn't hear repeats, Beethoven symphonies and Mozart symphonies. If you listen to recordings by some of the great conductors of the past, Bruno Walter, Thomas Beecham, people like that, they were masters at conducting movements in sonata form, Toscanini. But quite often, they would leave out the repeats. Well, why do they leave out the repeats? They leave out the repeats because they were so involved in their understanding of the music's forward momentum, the drama that was happening, that there was no room to go back and start over again. It would have driven them crazy. That was, it's indicative of the mindset of the conductors who were trained in that particular style, that there was no room for repeats in their interpretations because their interpretations were all forward moving. Now that sense of forward movement can, like I said, it can incorporate the need to take a repeat, but you have to understand that the idea of forward movement um, is primary and has to take precedence. In other words, they saw these movements whole as starting at point A and ending at point B and, and, and there were climaxes and events and things along the way, but they really saw the entire shape of the entire movement and that did not allow for repeats. And that's a very significant factor in the way they thought about it. Now, I happen to like repeats. I like first movement exposition repeats, for example, second half repeats, yeah, not so much. It depends on the interpretation and the performance. You can do it, you can do it and still maintain or recapture that forward momentum. You can, but you have to be aware of the problem and you have to be aware of what they're thinking of. Nowadays, conductors take repeats as a matter of course. It's just assumed everyone's gonna take every possible repeat. And if you take every possible repeat without understanding that, that you have to find a way not to undermine the music's forward motion when you take a repeat or how to recapture this forward motion, then you're gonna fail in your understanding of a sonata form movement, in your projection of the sonata form movement, in your explanation of what the music is doing. And it's a very, simple fact that you can latch on to to sort of understand the difference between the two periods. But there are also other issues. One of those issues is the need to be different. The fact that there are 500 million recordings of every piece of major symphonic music and certainly the standard repertoire and conductors are under terrible pressure to personalize interpretations. And quite often that personalization takes the form of emphasizing detail over larger structure, doing something different, something obvious, something obviously audibly different, whether it's highlighting a certain thing or, or doing an accent or changing a balance or doing something. But to the extent that these individual details draw attention to themselves as isolated moments in the course of the movement, they detract from that overall structure, that sense of forward motion that the music is, is trying 
is, is trying to express to us, that they should be trying to express to us. In other words, they give us performances that happen in fits and starts, that don't phrase in long sections, that have constant interruptions, things that tell us that this music is discontinuous, not continuous. And that's a huge problem. It's a huge problem. It, there are ways to be different, but it's much harder to be different in a subtle, large-scale way than it is to just do something stupid <laughs> in the middle of a phrase or, you know, you do something that's ear-catching. And then again, it doesn't mean that you can't do things that are ear-catching, but these things have to be integrated into the overall conception of the music. It's flow. And quite often today, they're not because all the obvious things that you can do um, or a lot of them have been done, um, or the extent to which they've been done is something that these guys aren't quite familiar with. However well they may understand the harmonic interconnections and the basis of the sonata form movement. So that's another issue that today's younger conductors confront, this need to personalize and characterize. Another issue, and it's related to this one, is what the period instrument movement has done. And this is ironic, because you would think that going back and playing music with the instruments and the techniques and the way that the composers expected or intended, I mean, however, however controversial or speculative that may be, you would think that that would support the dramatic overall conception of a movement, but as often as not, it doesn't. It doesn't because the period instrument movement is entirely based on sonority, on sound, on making the music sound different. It doesn't tell us anything about what the music expresses, about what its structure is, about how best to realize that structure. It, it tells us we should be making certain sounds. And to a certain extent, we should be playing those sounds at certain tempos. So those tempos should generally be much faster than what we were used to. Well, speed does not equal excitement nor does it always benefit our understanding and perception of musical structure. Sometimes you need to take time. Playing things with rigidly mechanical speeds um, may be detrimental to the give and take, the ebb and flow of the music, to the, to the, the expressive essence of its melodic material. Using period instruments is going to create all kinds of interesting noises, but if you spend your time creating all kinds of interesting noises, then once again, you could, you could be, not always, but you could be sacrificing the grander shape and structure of the movement for individual moments, for individual sounds. And you expect those sounds to do your job, which is create an, a, a cogent, expressive meaning for the entire, the entire movement that you're working on. So that's another issue that conductors face today in dealing with projecting the essence of a sonata form movement. So what I'm trying to say, and there are other things we can talk about. There, there really are quite a few other things, but, but in general, in general, what I, I would say is that the reason that today's conductors find sonata form movements difficult to deal with is, is the expectations of how they're supposed to be played and the need to try and create individual interpretations and the emphasis on incidental detail over matters of large scale structure. Um, now, it could have, there, back in the early days, the great days of the great conductors who understood what Sonata Form was doing very well, um, you could argue that they went too far in the other direction. There were conductors like Fort Fangler, for example, who is, was one of the great unity guys. He had a, an overall organic conception of everything that he touched. And, and he was able, at his best, to project that in an astonishingly powerful and effective way. The problem was, there was, he was so neglectful of incidental detail that many of his performances became a shambles and the actual audible results undermined that broader conception. Now, a lot of people hear the broader conception and say, well, we don't care about incidental detail. We don't care how sloppy and messed up it was. Well, I care. I don't think you should sacrifice one for the other. It's not a zero sum game, um, but he's a, he's a unique example, a special case of what was going on there, of what could happen when you go too far in the other direction, in my view, in my view. But 
you know, they're, they're, it, it's, it's never a question of, of, you know, everything being one way. There are plenty of modern conductors who really understand what's going on in sonata form movements. Manfred Hoenig understands sonata form movements. He really does. He gets them. Um, and there are some really good period instrument guys who also were very good at projecting, you know, the essence of sonata form movements. Franz Bruggen, Trevor Pinnock. I, you know, I could. they gave wonderful performances of those pieces and they understood what was going on. But when I say young modern conductors, I'm talking about some of the people that, you know, Klaus Mekela, he's a good example you know, of somebody who I think has questionable, questionable underpinnings, but we don't really know how good he is yet with sonata form movements, at least as far as recordings go, because Sibelius evolved past sonata form after his first symphony, basically. I mean, he still used it in interesting ways, but, you know, the rest is Stravinsky ballets and the other things he's recorded. Well, they don't have anything to do with that style. And probably he's smart that they don't, because we don't know where he's going to go with it. Will he understand it? Will he, will he show us that he understands that style? I don't know. I don't know. But there are plenty of other conductors, too, who have had um, iffy results. Thomas Fye was a wonderful example of somebody who was thrilling when he began his Haydn cycle, but later just became mechanical and hasty, and whose, whose affiliation with, on the one hand, you know, period instrument dogma, and on the other hand, um, you know, this... You know, the Nicholas Harnoncourt's very strange concept of rhetorical emphasis in music can undermine what a sonata movement wants to do. Harnoncourt himself was an excellent example of that. Sometimes he was just marvelous, you know, conducting sonata form movements. And other times it was just weird because he sectionalized everything. You know, he had some concept that was not the concept that the composer had when he wrote the piece. So you, 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 each example is its own special case. We have to keep on listening and take things as they come. But in general, in general, it is much more difficult, I think, for today's young conductors to express the essence of sonata form movements than it was in former times. And um, I think a great deal of them don't even understand the nature of the problem, <laughs> even though they claim to understand sonata form. You can understand sonata form without understanding the music that's in sonata form. Um, and so those are those are some of the things that I wanted to just toss out there and uh, let you uh, chew on. So thank you for joining me, friends. Keep on listening and take care.